All right, so we've got, we're going to go fast today. Thankfully, it's in a second review chapter, or predominantly review. It's going to be acid spaces, and we're just going to get resituated because a lot of our rationale for what we're going to be doing will be involving transfer of electrons. So even though there's going to be discrepancies we're going to introduce, whenever you have uh, some, hmm, here we go. Different notations. Generalizable acid and some generalizable base. A lot of what we're going to be doing for our organic chemistry is rationalizing why an electron or a pair of electrons will go from one nucleus to another and start sharing between the two. So in acid-base reactions, which are also, you can call proton transfer reactions, but they're most commonly called acid-base, you're going to see a scenario where a pair of electrons will attack a proton breaking the bond that existed between that proton and its conjugate base. <laughs> Um, but we're also going to see an analogy here fairly soon where we'll start to talk about nucleophilic attacks on electrophiles. <coughs> and there is some differences. There are some differences between what a base is and a nucleophile, but very often there's also a lot of overlap. So a lot of the rationale for acid-base chemistry is going to apply, in terms of pushing electrons, is going to apply for nucleophilic attack on electrophiles. And that's going to make up an enormous amount of the total rationale for what we do in basic organic chemistry. So that said, let's go ahead and jump into acids and bases. So the most common definition for the acid bases, there's a few different, is Bronsted-Lowry. And Bronsted-Lowry came up with the definition of acid where acids lose protons and bases gain or slash accept protons as their chemistry. This makes sense because if we're looking at our general description of an acid, we pull the H out to the front, we have some conjugate base that it's attached to, and that is, in an acid, able to dissociate losing the proton while some base accepts it by donating electrons to it and stabilizing it. So that's the classic definition. We'll look at the Lewis definition at the very end of the chapter, but most of our rationale is going to be around Bronsted-Lowry for this chapter. So let's take a look. We're just going to get into some really, really simple examples of acids, and then we're going to start to add some acid-base reactions, and we're going to start to add some nuance to it. And we're going to start doing some predictions of equilibria based on relative strengths of the acids. And one of the things I want you guys to keep in mind when we're doing organic chemistry is we're going to talk about something behaving as an acid. There's going to be scenarios where things that are relatively weak acids, like alcohols, will behave as acids. There will be scenarios where those weak acids will behave as bases. And which one, the manner in which they behave will depend on what's around them, what other reactants are available, and what their environment is in terms of the pH of the reaction conditions. So we won't be able to just think of acids and bases as that's an acid, that's a base. We're going to have to look at the scenario in which that compound is placed to determine whether it behaves as an acid or a base in that scenario. So just like it, it gets a little bit more complex. Um, for a really simple example, if we look at hydrochloric acid, which is one of our classic strong acids, and we put it in water, 
there's going to be an equilibria. It's going to be a very mild equilibria, which favors products because we know that strong acids tend towards full dissociation. And when this dissociates, that's what we discuss in terms of the language in 100 level, it dissociates. Well, what's really going on is this is acting as a base, is grabbing this proton, kicking off the chloride. Making a chloride anion and hydronium. So in this particular scenario, because we always talk about reactions the direction they're drawn, the way they proceed, where this is our reactants and this is our products, if we were to flip this, we could discuss this as a reactant and this as a product as part of an equilibrium which is not favorable. But we always discuss it, reactants, products, left to right. This is our acid for the reaction. This will behave as our base. This, basic definitions, because this is generalizably representative of an acid and its conjugate, this will become our conjugate base to our acid, and this will be our conjugate acid to our base. Um, conversely, we could have something like ammonia, which is in water a base, but in this case water will act as the acid because of the differences in their relative pKa's and this is going to favor reactants. We're going to get into why this happens but if we were to draw this in um, ammonia if it were to accept a proton would become ammonium this would be the conjugate acid And this would become, the water would lose the proton because it's donating its proton and becoming hydroxide, which is our conjugate base. And those of you who have some intuition for these kind of equilibria acid-base reactions from 106 would say, oh man, well hydroxide's a pretty darn good base in aqueous systems, so this is probably why we're favoring that reaction. We know that ammonium is a moderate weak acid, so that would make sense while we're going in that direction. Um, so that's just some of the basics. Um, some rules we're going to refer to, the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. So when an acid is really strong, its conjugate base is not going to be very basic. When an acid is weak, its conjugate base is going to be relatively strong. You always have these opposite pairings. So the opposite holds true for this as well, obviously. Um, and that's going to be really important for rationalizing why things proceed the direction they do later in the chapter. So we're going to be referring to this kind of rationale a lot. Okay, Quick review of peak H and, P and Ka and pKa. Come on. Really good marker. I think somebody came in here and used a little bit of cleaning spray on this. Um, let's see here. So for any, just get everybody kind of back in the group, for any generalizable reaction, ooh, A plus B is an equilibria forming C plus D, we can describe what's happening with this equilibrium system by going to an equilibrium constant. So equilibrium expression for any generalizable reaction is reactants over products. So the concentration of C 
to the C power times concentration of D to the D power over reactant A and reactant B. What this is is just an expression of reactants, the ratio of reactants to the ratio of products. Excuse me, products to reactants. What do the lowercase letters denote? Um, the molar quantities. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if they're all one, this disappears. But if this is one, two, two, one, then B would have B squared and C would be squared. So it's just a ratio. <laughs> what it's telling you, if you have a large value in KEQ, is that products are favored. And if you have a small value, reactants are favored, meaning it doesn't proceed. And if you think of it as a ratio of products to reactants, that makes absolute sense. People get too hung up on rules surrounding a number being high or large and they don't rationalize why a large number or a small number makes sense. So for acid-base reactions, we're going to be using the classic HA aqueous solution is in equilibrium forming hydronium plus, let's see here, yeah, our conjugate. And if we do the exact same thing for this acid-base reaction, what it looks like is KEQ equals the concentration of hydronium, which could also be considered just free protons, over times conjugate base over concentration of our acid and concentration of water. Now, this is not what you guys have typically seen for acid-base reactions. You've seen K sub A, acid dissociation constant. And the reason that is, is because concentration of water is also a constant, and it's 55.5 molar, because everything's in solution with liquid water, and that is what the concentration of water is as a liquid is constant. So what we can do is we can pull the concentration of water out, and this is actually what K sub A is. K sub A is just the equilibrium expression for an acid base times 55.5. It's the same thing. So if you're ever getting a K sub, a K sub A and you want to find the KEQ, just divide by 55.5, and that's what the value is. Um, this has the exact same rationale. This also, remember, hydronium is also just an expression for free proton. This is a product over reactant expression. So if you have a large K sub A, that means that you have a lot of product, which means you have a lot of free protons, which means you're very acidic. So high K sub A means acidic. Low K sub A means you have a lot of non-dissociated weak acid, which means those protons are not free in solution, which means you are less acidic. Now, the thing is, like every other expression in chemistry, we have these huge ranges of orders of magnitude for what can happen with K sub A. So what we most commonly look at isn't K sub A, it's pKa. And so the pKa, just like pH equals the negative log of the concentration of protons, the pKa is the negative log of Ka. And just like this causes large numbers to become very small, this does the same thing. So as, whereas a, Ka, a large Ka means you have a lot of uh, something that's behaving like an acid, and low means it's not very acidic, a pKa which is low is a stronger acid 
and a higher pKa means you have a weaker acid. Any questions so far before we start moving through? No, nope. this is all review. It's not all stuff that everyone remembers necessarily right yet, but actually y'all probably already did all these problems on the homework and you probably remember it now. So. Okay, so moving along. Like I said before, there's a lot of organic functional groups which can behave as acids or bases based on their environment. And the main tool we have in our toolbox to evaluate how something behaves is pKa. We're going to reference pKa a lot. So we're looking at the pKa's, relative pKa's of reactants and products, as well as the pKa of different reactants in solutions which have different pHs. So we're going to be carrying, comparing pKa's. We're also going to be comparing um, pKa's to their pH of their environment. Um, good examples of things that are acidic by definition or are weak acids. We'll do one weak acid and one pretty darn weak acid and then we'll um, start to play with some variations on that. Uh, carboxylic acids are pretty, <coughs> are okay acids, right? So this is acetic acid, its pKa is 4.76. We also have another one, formic acid, where the, pro, uh, the methyl group becomes a hydrogen. This one's a little bit more acidic, it's 3.75, and circled protons are our acidic protons. Uh, conversely, we have, let's say, methanol. And its pKa is in the 15.5. Mm, and ethanol is also similar. Could add another uh, carbon in there. Notice that these look the same functionally, but they have different, very different pKa's. This is a very decent acid, as a weak acid. This. That's pKa that's not that different from water. They're pretty similar. This is not a fantastic acid unless you put it in an environment which facilitates it behaving as an acid. It can behave as an acid, but you have to give it a little push. So whereas this one um, can behave as an acid or a base also, but will tend to be acidic or often because it has a pKa, which describes it liking to lose the proton more readily. This? That's methanol. Our most simple alcohol. Yes. So let's, yeah. Can you explain why the acid on the right is a stronger acid than the one on the left? We will get there. It's um, induction of electrons. So, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that description of, of why substituents affect relative acidity near the end of the chapter. So let's talk about predicting acid-base reactions. So let's do a really easy one. Hydrochloric acid in water. What's going to happen? Well, if we were to look this up 
I mean, intuition, because we've done a little bit of chemistry at this point, says, well, it's a strong, one of the classic strong acids in water it associates. So, of course, it's going to proceed favorably. That's why it's a strong acid. But let's use some terms so that we can apply those terms to scenarios that are less intuitive. Um, for hydrochloric acid, pKa equals negative 7, I think. Negative, yeah. Yes. It's very acidic. It breaks the, it breaks the scale. Um, water, pKa equals 15.7. So methanol is only 0.2 uh, pKa units more acidic than water. In this description, you can see very low pKa, very high pKa, or not very high, a mm, pretty high pKa. And a big difference between the two, which means there's going to be a large motivation for one to act as an acid and one to act as a base. The one with the lower value will tend to act as the acid. So in this particular case, we can predict with some confidence that the proton will move from the hydrochloric acid to the water and we'll get formation of hydronium and chloride. Um, if we wanted to rationalize this by pushing electrons, the water is going to act as our base, and we'll have our hydrochloric acid, a lone pair from the water can attack our proton. This exceeds the number of bonds allowable to a proton. We can't have two bonds of protons. So as this bond forms, this bond breaks, pushing both electrons to the chlorine. The chlorine can house all eight electrons because it likes that extra electron, because that gives its noble gas character. So this is a fairly good leaving group. And in the end, we have a pair of products that are lower energy slash more stable than our pair of reactants were. So this is just our rationale if you wanted to see why the electrons are going from one place to another. Um, but we can also just talk about rationale in terms of which one's more acidic, which one's more basic, and, and come to it from the same direction. Um, let's do one that's a little A scenario that's a little less intuitive. Let's do <coughs> acetic acid plus ammonia. I'll even throw in the lone pair for the ammonia here. And we have some equilibrium. We don't know which direction it's leaning towards. And That will give us, if this dissociates, acetate anion. And ammonium cation. So the question here is, if we wanted to figure out we know this direction is going to have a high likelihood because this is a weak acid and this is a weak base. We have some intuition around that from previous courses. But which direction is favored? Is it going to favor products as drawn or reactants as drawn? So what we can look at is, well, and the general rule for this kind of scenario is equilibrium favors the formation of the weaker acid. Why does that make sense that the weak acid's favored? Because it doesn't disassociate very well. Yes, which implies that it is more, more stable. stable. Right. So this is a tendency, this is a description of something tending towards stability slash lower reactivity, which is the nature of things. So this isn't just some weird rule that doesn't make sense. If you forget this rule, you should be able to come to this rule based on just thinking, okay, is a strong acid more stable or is a weak acid more stable? 
the weak acid, therefore we want that to be our favored product. Um, so based on this rule, if we just look at our two acids, does this look like an acid? Can't, does it have a proton <laughs> that it can give up? Yeah. What about that? Does this like to give up a proton? No. Does it have a proton it likes to give up? Already did it. What about that? Also an acid. So we've identified our two most likely candidates as acids. If you didn't know this, you could get pKa's for all of these and figure out which ones are acids and which ones are more likely to behave as bases. Um, but in this case, this is 4.76 for the pKa, and this one over here is the ammonium is 9.4. Still, reasonable acid, just not as strong as the acetic acid. Therefore, equilibrium will tend towards products as um, written. So this is how you can determine if you don't know what's favored. You can get into a table, pull up pKa's. Oh, somebody asked, you don't have to memorize all the pKa's. All right, that's not part of this class. You have to memorize a lot of things in this class. That's not one of them. Um, so you're going to just by use remember the common ones. Some of you already have started to remember a lot of the common ones, and that's good. But you don't have to sit down at the table because that's what we have tables for. Um, and I won't even make you use tables in the test because I don't want people flipping through pages during a test when I know you guys can use a table. It's a 300 level class. So PKs that you need, or and maybe some PKs that you don't need, could, will be included in problems for this kind of problem. Do you want another example of this before we move on? Yeah, One more example? Yeah. Okay. We have another. We have examples. We like. I like examples. I like examples. Yeah. I think we have time for, for another example. Let's say we want to evaluate ethanol. Plus methylamine is in some equilibrium condition with ethoxide, which is the conjugate base to ethanol. And the protonated methylamine, which is the equivalent of ammonium. Whenever you see a deprotonated alcohol, that is a so in the same sense that water's conjugate base is hydroxide, any alcohol, because remember this or methanol, this is very, very similar pKa to water. <coughs> These are called alkoxides. So hydroxide to water, alkoxides, in this case ethoxide to ethanol. This is not a very strong acid, right? We already know that. This is going to be a very strong base. Whenever you see a deprotonated alcohol, these are very powerful bases on the same level and often slightly more so than hydroxides. So just for reference throughout this class, when you see um, deprotonated alcohols, you know they're going to be strong bases. So if we're pulling up pKa's, pKa for ethanol is 15.9. We know that that's a base. This has a free pro or proton that we can kick off to make this a conjugate to it, and its pKa is 10.7. So in this scenario, we're going to go from a strong acid, again, tending towards a weak acid in equilibrium, meaning in this scenario, equilibrium will be biased towards the reactants. There will be some reaction, however, a majority 
of the equilibrium will lie on this side. Well, what happens if we want to actually calculate this to know exactly how much it's biased? Mm, super easy, thankfully. So P, K, K, Q for any scenario like this is going to be the pKa of the reactant acid minus the pKa of the product acid. This will always be the reactant side. This will always be the product side of this. Which direction is favored is not in question because that's going to be sorted out in the magnitude of the equilibrium expression. Does that end up being equal to zero or like what is it? What is it? It's just uh, it's, it's a it's it, uh, pK doesn't have a unit. Okay. okay. It's unitless, just like pH is unitless. Um, so what you do in this particular case is you would say fifteen point nine. This is pretty rough, I know. Minus 10.7, whatever that gives you, then you have to raise everything to the 10th power to get rid of the log. Because P to KEQ is going to equal the negative log base 10 of KEQ. So to get KEQ, you just raise that and give it a negative. Yeah? Just for the fun of it. Draw the electron arrows on the top one? Is it the three pair on nitrogen affecting the things on the other side? Well, let's do, yeah. Yeah, even though it's not a preferred reaction, we can draw it. So, what's going to happen here is this is going to behave as our acid, this will behave as our base. So, the base is going to be donating the electrons to the proton so that we end up with that being proton less. So in this case, let's draw it like this. In this case, the lone pair from this base is going to attack the proton. That's going to exceed the duet breaking this bond, pushing that pair of bonding electrons to that oxygen. Because it's grabbing a proton but isn't getting any more electrons, it's going to end up with a positive charge. Because this is accepting another pair of electrons and not sharing them, it's going to end up with your negative charge. So that's the electron acid base rationale. Any more questions on this <coughs> before we move on? Yes? So is there like a general rule for determining where the proton is lost from any given structure? There's, um, there's a lot of structural considerations that factor in there. The o most overarching rule, and we're about to get there, I don't know why we haven't, I hope I haven't skipped it accidentally, is that what makes something a good, when a weak acid loses its proton, the conjugate base needs to be as stable as possible. Um, the really good example of that is hydrochloric acid. In this particular case, it's very easy for some base to attack this proton and push the electrons to the chlorine because the chlorine likes having the extra electrons. It likes to have that octet. So it's perfectly content to exist like this, which really facilitate, it doesn't really care about that proton. 
it's okay sharing the proton the electrons between the proton for now but this isn't bad either so the better a conjugate base is after losing a specific proton or the more stable it is after losing that proton the more likely it is to lose that proton and therefore behave as an acid so any particular proton you're evaluating for whether it's going to leave and act as an acidic proton needs to have a rationale which involves a stable leaving group or conjugate base in this case. If that, and we're going to go through, there's lots of different considerations into that that we're going to start getting into throughout the year, but that's overall probably the best rationale for why any one proton will leave versus another. For instance, if we were to evaluate methane, if you were to try to pull one of these off, you would end up with a methyl anion, and that is super, super, super unhappy, super reactive, that doesn't like to form. Therefore, it's very hard to pull this proton off, therefore it's not a good acid. In fact, it's a very, very, very poor acid. Good questions. Any other questions? I love OCAM because you actually get good questions versus how do I blackboard? <laughs> I would say four or five emails regarding my 100 level classes in the first month are nothing to do with the class other than the logistics of how to student, um, which is OK because everyone's figuring it out. But this is so much more fun. Uh, any more questions? If anyone asks how to blackboard, it's on. <laughs> somebody was thinking it. No? OK, good. Before you guys, somebody's a wisecracker in here. Um, oh. Yeah. Seriously, I want to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> Five demerits. I, I don't have demerits in the syllabus, so I can't do that. I actually, at some point, as an experiment, I think it was in OCHEM 2. It was in OCHEM 2. I was like, you know what I'm going to do? Because it was not a very involved class. This class is easy because you guys are asking questions and interacting. And they're just sitting there. I was like, oh, God, I don't want to talk to McGill. So I like, OK, what we're going to do is we're going to add some kind of extra credit incentive. We're going to divide in four groups. And you're going to have house names. Sounds familiar at this point. <laughs> and you get positive points for participating. And if somebody does something really not bright, your group might get penalized. So you have a little peer pressure to squash the, the silliness. It's like, this might work. What I didn't know is this is the particular group that happened to be of the perfect age to become enormous Harry Potter enthusiasts. enthusiasts. And it got out of control. I, um, I had to squash it <laughs> because you know, everyone's like, I'm in this group. No, I'm in this group. I'm like, I was going to just like arbitrary. There's no sorting hat here. I'm the sorting hat. <laughs> One group, two group, three group. You're a Gryffindor. You're a Slytherin. It's like, I'm a Hufflepuff. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> um, and people got emotional. It was really, I was like, OK, there's no, this is done. This is super done. We're not, there's no demerits for any of this. Um, but they actually got interactive for a day. Um, so, all right. How structure affects pKa? Or structure and how acidic something is. <coughs> a couple considerations. Um, we've already talked about this, but the weaker the base, the stronger the acid, the stronger the base, the weaker the conjugate acid. Or Conversely, the stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base. Um, that pairing is always going to be have that relationship. So the better an acid is, the worse the conjugate is going to be. Great example, hydronium, pretty darn good acid. Water is its conjugate base. Not a particularly basic thing. 
can behave as a base. It can also behave as an acid. But it's not super motivated to either of those things. So, which is why we can get in a bath and not get, you know, digested. Like if we were sitting in one molar sodium hydroxide. Um, so, strong acid, weak base. Let's say um, strong base. We could conjugate acid. So same idea. Um, where we have a strong weak strong weak relationship, um, we could do the exact same op the op opposite of this, where we could say a weak acid would have a strong base, etc. Um, so if this if this were behaving as an acid, because water can behave as an acid, although a weak acid, fifteen point seven pKa, the base conjugate base would be a strong base. So now that we've reviewed that for the second time, do I have a question? No. Does someone just clearing the throat? Impacts of different factors. So size. I'm going to start with size. If we are looking at a periodic table, I'm not even going to attempt to draw a periodic table on the whiteboard. <laughs> and we're all the way over the right side, and everything's very electronegative. We're going to go to size as, so I see fluorine, make, erase, make these bigger. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine. Iodine. Which one's the most electronegative? Uh, fluorine. fluorine, right? Most electronegative atom. Cool. So this is the most electronegative, but they are all pretty darn electronegative. And which one has the smallest atomic radius? Fluorine. Fluorine, fluorine which has by far the most largest yeah. atomic radius? Uh, iodine. Iodine. So if we rank these in terms of their relative acidity for Hydrofluoric acid versus hydrochloric acid versus ooh, hydrobromic acid versus hydroiodic acid. Note that these are all actually, no, they're not all strong acids. Which of these is not a strong acid in the lists of strong acids? Hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid. It's, a very, it's a very strong acid functionally, but it doesn't meet the criteria for full dissociation of a cla of strong acid when you're introduced to 105 acids. I have a friend who's so strong, I know a guy who spilled hydrofluoric acid on himself, and the medics actually scooped it out of his arm with a spoon, but he's fun at parties, so he likes to take shots out of his forearm. Uh, if you, yeah, it's not like a full one, one and a half ounce shot, but it's an impressive size shot coming out of a forearm. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, he's super fun at parties. Um, chemists aren't always lame. Chemists and tequila is a fun reaction. Because um, they're so repressed, they're like, oh, I'm not, okay, we're cutting that off. <laughs> we're cutting it off. All right, so, you all now have an intuition that this is weaker than the rest of these for some reason. And the reason is because of atomic radius or slash size. If we're trying to pull a proton off of something, is it easier to pull it off of this? Or that? <clears throat> that, right? Because of atomic radius considerations and valence electrons being vastly more distant from the nucleus, the sharing of electrons between this nucleus and this nucleus cannot be remotely as strong because a shorter bond is a stronger bond and a longer bond is a weaker bond. That means it's much easier to take this proton than it is to take this proton just because the bond that you have to break to give it up is a weaker bond. So in that consideration, 
atomic radius makes a very large difference in terms of how good something is at letting go of a proton. That's also the rationale for why hydrofluoric acid is not technically a strong acid. It's because all of those electrons are packed into such a small space that adding more electrons as part of a bond is a little bit constrained. It's a little bit packed to add some more electrons. But when you go out into these more distant orbitals, because let's say this is you know, several quantum numbers down, you have a lot more room, adding another pair of electrons in that large zone doesn't provide any kind of electrical negative to negative charge resistance. And really, you don't encounter that from pretty much you're down, although it's easier, which is why iodine is the most, or hydroiodic acid is the most acidic of all of these. Um, so we've got size as consideration. We've got electronegativity. So electronegativity, if we have no size, significant size implication because we're in the same quantum level, so let's say the one that we deal with by far the most in organic chemistry, let's say carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, these have similar atomic radii. They're not identical, but they're similar. However, you have significant differences in electric negativity. So in this regard, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, fluorine is going to be the one that's going to be able to let go of protons more easily. Um, on the extreme ends of the examples here, we have methane, we have hydrofluoric acid. If we lose a proton off of methane, we have a methyl anion, which is a very unhappy thing and is super reactive. And here we have fluoride, which is fairly content to be fluoride. So this is a good example of this being the most stable conjugate base, which is why it's able to let go of that hydrogen, whereas this is unstable. Therefore, it really doesn't want to let go of that proton, and therefore, it's a terrible acid. So, And the last consideration, which is the least impactful of all of these, but can come up occasionally, is hybridization. Is that a question back here? Yeah. Okay. Um, does the most, the more stable base become a stronger or weaker base? Does more stable mean stronger or weaker when it comes to base? Stable things are always less reactive. Okay. So a really stable base is a weak base. Because it's stable, it's not wanting to pull so, things away from it. Yeah, so here's a way to think of it. Is that fluorine super motivated to go grab a proton off of something else? Nope. So it's not really a very good base. It can behave as a base because it can run over here and attack some electrophile or grab a proton. It can do it, but it's not great at it. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the degree of hybridization, the rationale for this is going to be very, very similar to the size, but the differences between size and hybrids are not the same. Um, so we've got sp hybrids, we've got sp2 hybrids, we've got sp3 hybrids, and 
A good example of an SP hybrid would be a simple triple bond between two carbons. SP2, a simple double bond between two carbons. And SP3, a single bond between two carbons. With this being SP, that being SP2, that being SP3. The pKa's of these are, none of these are impressive acids. Right out the gate. What's the pKa of water? 15.7. 15.7. This one is 25. This one's 44. This one's 60-ish. Because... I love that number. Yeah. Well, because it's so hard to... It's so not acidic at that point. It's really, really hard to nail down reproducibly how not acidic it is. If that makes sense. I still like the ish. That's all I like. I like the ish, too. Yeah. Ish. So, that means that this is relatively more acidic than this, which is relatively more acidic than this but none of them are particularly willing to donate their protons. Um, however, sometimes this kind of thing comes into play because you can come in and we can, we can pull that off. We, we, we will see down the road in alkyne chapters examples of some base swooping in and taking a proton and putting a charge and a lone pair on one of those carbons. We will be seeing that. Um, so, why? We have a, we, okay, that one went up first. It was like the buzzer. It's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. The triple bonds are shorter than the double bonds are shorter than the single bonds. So the electrons are held more tightly. Yes, they are shorter, meaning we have a stronger bond here. What does that Let's see here? <clears throat> More S character. So fifty percent S character, thirty three percent S character, twenty five percent S character, which is why the bonds are shorter. Because you have higher S character, therefore the electrons are going to be closer between the nuclei because S orbitals are closer to the nuclei. So it's easier to move these electrons to that carbon because they're going to be housed a little more closely and held more tightly. Um, so yeah, it's the shorter, stronger bond and the higher ratio of S to P orbital as we move along. Um, notice these are important values, but if one of them is housed on a much larger diameter, um, the magnitude of the effect is not the same as if you're moving from uh, a relatively small orbital to a very, very large orbital, like we did in our first example. Sorry, did you okay. say that the SP, it, it has 50% S character? Yes. And it has triple bonds, so it's short, mm -hmm. which and would make strong. it harder to break those bonds? Oh, no, no, no. This, this bond is strong and short, and this carbon is hybridized. So, okay, here we go. Uh, let me draw it out. Yeah, we'll draw it out. So, because there's only two hybrids, because it's sp2, this will be an sp2 s bond. And then the other bonds will go via p orbitals across. And so, because this is an sp orbital to s bond, 
it's going to be shorter because there's more S character here than here, where this is an SP three to S bond. But we're doing okay. I think we're gonna. So funny story. Yesterday in biochemistry, I was going really fast. I was like, I got to get through this because we only have one day to get through this chapter. Oh, my goodness. And then I realized we hadn't skipped Tuesday. <laughs> so I have a really short lecture to deliver tomorrow in biochemistry. <laughs> they only have like six slides left. Well, did you tell them at least that they have good, you know, question time then? No, but I told them how to make cocaine in the jungle. Um, <laughs> so I had to slow down. I had to do something just yeah. to, to get people off track or else we were going to finish the chapter and have to take a day off. And that's just silly. Um, I mean, who doesn't want to come to class at 8.30 in the morning? So, no. but, they, but I did slow down. I realized what was going on and they appreciated that. Unlike this class where you have to get through the whole chapter, but it's really kind of a micro chapter. The next chapter is a pretty big chapter though. Um, let's talk about substituents and the effects of substituents. This will come back to one of your questions with electrons being withdrawn. So, let me get rid of this too. All right, so impact of substituents. Let's say we've got acetic acid because it's nice, weak acid. And then let's say we add a substituent or we change one of these protons out for something that's electronegative. Um, we'll say a bromine. We'll just do a couple of these examples. And we'll do a fluorine. So this has pKa of 4.76. This is 2.86, this is 2.66. What we're seeing here is an effect, an effect uh, bromine, not boron. <sighs> R's matter. When it's boron and bromine, it does. Um, what we're seeing, that's our acidic protons. So we have one, two, three, four bonds, because each of these counts, between, let's say, this being the arbitrary proton that's moving, even though they're identical. So one, two, three, four bonds away from the acid, but adding electronegative groups over here makes that proton more likely to dissociate. And this is called induction. The book calls it inductive electron withdrawal, but electron indu induction. When something is highly electronegative, it's going to support it likes holding electrons, right? It's okay with a little extra, extra electrical density. We see that in these highly polar covalent bonds where instead of an electron being shared equally between these two because this is so electronegative, it's sharing it's more like this. It's like a big kid hoarding all of the electrons because it wants them. And the hydrogen is like, hey, uh, okay, there you go. As long as I get a little bit. Same thing going on here and here. Notice this is more electronegative, so it's going to be even more acidic, but only 0.2 pKa is more acidic. It's not the same magnitude of two pH units uh, more acidic. So the reason why goes back to the stabilization of the conjugate base. How happy is a conjugate base? Well, if we come in with some base and take this proton, breaking this bond, pushing the electrons onto that oxygen, what we're going to see 
is the formation of a conjugate base, which is our carboxylate. And we're going to talk about why about this in resonance in just a second. But before we get there, let me draw this out again. <laughs> Are protons particularly electron withdrawing? No, they're not super electronegative. In fact, they're pretty happy to give up their electrons, right? So they're poorly electronegative. Whereas if we do the exact same thing over here, we have some base swoop in, take this proton, break this bond, push the electrons onto that oxygen. will also have a carboxylate, but this is electron withdrawing. So what makes something an, a happy conjugate base is it needs to hold on to those electrons. It has to be happy holding on to that extra pair of electrons. And if it has something has to own charge, it has to be either very electronegative or there has to be something else nearby helping hold those electrons. So if the oxygen has to fully hold this pair of electrons, it can, but it's not super thrilled to do so. However, fluorine really likes electrons, so it's actually pulling electrons towards it, which makes this a little bit charged, positive, which makes it pull electrons a little bit more strongly, which makes this pull electrons a little bit more strongly. and so. The inductive effect of having the fluorine, this highly electronegative atom, attached is going to be pulling electrons off of that oxygen a little bit. It helps relieve it of that full negative charge, which makes it more stable. I was going to say happier, but more stable, happier. Makes it a better leaving group, which make, means it's a, it's a weaker base. It's, it's, yeah, a strong base is like, man, I need to do something with these electrons and go react with something right now. This is pretty happy as compared to this, which is like, well, it's okay, but not as happy as that. You had a question? So um, it's only No, because it's not housing full electrons, it's just pulling a little extra electrical density. So the electronegativity is going to outweigh the size consideration because we're four bonds away. Um, however, and so a good example of why that matters is let's say we make a comparison here. In this case, we were substituting the bromine here. What if we moved it here? We'll call this position one, two, three etc. As we move further away, one bond at a time, this effect is going to diminish rapidly. Um, I think if we move one bond away, it goes from, let's see, for bromine 2.86, we move another bond away, it's 4-ish, 3 worst. Once we get over here, there's, there's really no difference. So inductive effects have a limited range. And you can see it at four bonds. You can see a little bit of five bonds, because four is still more acidic than 4.76. But it, it starts to get very negligible after we get to this position. So um, don't try to rationalize. If you see an electronegative group way over here, and you see a change in pKa over here, there's something else that you have to use as a rationale. Let's talk about delocalization um, a little bit slash resonance. So we just talked, I just talked about stuff needing to be happy and distribute electrical charge. And our best, I, I spend a lot of time using carboxylic acids as examples because they're that nice, they're acidic but not too acidic. Um, why is we don't have an electronegative difference here. This so much more, so much more acidic than 
Nothing all. The double bond. What about the double bond? Swap two. The double bond converted to a low pair. There's one. There's two words. There's two key words. Delocalization and or resonance. Is it fair to say that double bond is what makes the conjugate base weaker? So that means the acid is stronger? Mm, let me show you. It's um, not really, the double bond facilitates the resonance, but it's not really the presence of the double bond next to it, not per se. So, so let's say we just do the chemistry here. We have some base, takes this proton, pushes the electrons to form a carboxylate. Which now has a charge on it. If we do the same thing with methanol, we will get methoxide. Once again, they look like the same thing, but they're not. We don't have something super electron with a drawing. In fact, this is quite electron rich um, with all the electrons already housed but, um, on that oxygen. So what's happening here, clean this up a little bit, is we have the ability to form an equivalent resonance structure by taking, so this, if we were me to measure this, these bonds. You would think that this is a shorter, stronger bond and this is a longer, weaker bond. You would think that we would see more electrical charge here than we do here. But what you actually see experimentally is that both bonds are equivalent and both oxygens have equal charge. And the reason that happens is because we have two equivalent resonance structures. This pair of electrons can form a new bond carbon that exceeds the octet to the carbon though, we now have one, two, three, four, five bonds. Carbon doesn't like five bonds. But we can break this bond, push the electrons up to that oxygen, and now we've housed that charge on this oxygen. Now what's really important is this is not an equilibrium system. Notice when I draw resonance, it looks like this, not like this. This is equilibrium. You're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. This is resonance. There is no back and forth. This resonance, we have to draw multiple structures with this double-sided arrow between it because neither Lewis structure is a good representation of what's taking place. The combination of all of both of these simultaneously is what is taking place, which is why we have half a double bond character here and half a double bond character here, half a full charge here, half a full charge here. But we can't draw half double bonds and half charges. So we show one scenario with a double bond, other scenario, one charge, one charge, and it's the average of these two structures. Yeah. You said they're not equilibrium in that they're not changing back and forth. Yes. They are not in equilibrium. Resonance has nothing to do with equilibrium. This is one thing that is an average of these two things. Which is why you should never, 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 never draw resonance structures with these arrows. And you should never describe equilibrium with this. The important point of this is this is the conjugate base to this. Stable conjugate bases mean stronger acids. This is stable because it's distributed this electrical charge across two nuclei. It's now housing half an electrical charge instead of housing a full electrical charge, which the methoxide has to do, which is why this is a very strong base, equivalent to hydroxide, and this is a weak base, which is why this is a weak acid because it is loath to give up this proton and accept all of these electrons. And this is a pretty darn good acid because it's okay giving up that proton, taking these electrons and distributing them across both positions.
So there's, like I said, there's lots of different rationale <clears throat> for what makes something a acidic proton, but it all comes down to how happy is the conjugate base at taking those extra electrons to facilitate the loss of the proton. That's the most important underlying rationale, and then we have different ways to get to that rationale based on the structure. But resonance is going to be super, super important for facilitating loss of electrons um, throughout the rest of the semester. Any questions? Yes? Um, that top structure, how, could you just use like the induction principle you just talked about, because it's attached to that oxygen, which we call it more electronegative towards it? Mm. Mm, that's the rationale for why it can hold. It's not induction, it's just electronegative. Oxygen is slightly electronegative, therefore, please tell me that I'm recording. I am. And then, how does, the, <laughs> how does the hydrogen attach to one oxygen or the other when they essentially are acting the same with the electrons going between them? With the hydrogen, oh, here? Yeah, how does the hydrogen attach to that oxygen versus the other one when essentially they have the same electron configuration? They don't. They don't. And when it has the hydrogen, they're different. Okay, so the electron when, just like pops over. There's the no electron. resonance to be had here. If I try to draw a resonance form, this is a super common mistake people make, so it's not it's not a bad question. It's a super common mistake. People like, oh, I can draw a resonance structure here. Boom, boom. Make a resonance structure. Problem is this is not equivalent because now you have a full negative charge and a full positive charge and you're putting a positive charge on oxygen that's an electronegative atom. So this works because we have that extra pair of electrons to distribute. These are already happy. Is there a molecule where the H could attach to that upper oxygen or is that just a different? Um, you can protonate a carboxyl group, okay. but it is also not very happy to do so. That's super acidic Okay. because of that positive charge on the oxygen. Okay. Oxygen doesn't dig positive charges. Okay, let's see here. We have three minutes. I hear everybody getting antsy. They're like, I got to run. OK, so OK. Mm. I got to do it. henderson hasselbach equation, <laughs> everyone's favorite. This is super important. The reason this is super important is because this is We've been talking about, I said, the environment affects the way acids behave. Synopsis. If I put some random acid in solution, and the solution is highly acidic, let's say this has a pKa of <clears throat> 5, and the solution's super acidic, say a pH of 1. This weak acid in a solution which is highly acidic will no longer tend to behave as an acid. And we can do it because we can talk about effects of pH on any compound with a particular pKa on impacting the ratio of the dissociated and associated form. Or we can think of it as a Lachatelier's effect where every time that this leaves, there's rapidly a proton to re-engage it because of it being an acidic solution. You can use either rationale. But what's important is if you put a weak acid in a solution that's highly acidic, it doesn't behave as an acid anymore. It's going to tend towards its more mm, dissoci uh, associated form, which means it's not going to like to give up that proton. If you put it in a solution which is basic, say pH of 12, it's going to readily act as an acid 
because its environment is more basic than it is and be happy to give up this proton to solution or to something else. That's what this is a description of. That's all that we're looking at here. We're saying for any compound with a specific proclivity to lose its proton in any particular environment, there will be a ratio between the acid form and the basic form here. And that ratio is very easy to determine for any compound with a pKa under any pH condition. So how, so how acidic something behaves in its environment depends on how acidic or basic the environment is relative to it. That's it. If the pH equals the pKa, these are in a one-to-one -one ratio. If the pH is one unit away from the pKa on either side, it's going to be a 90%, 10% ratio. If you move two pH units away from either side, it's going to be a 99 to 1 ratio. If you move three, it'll be a 99.9% to 0.1% ratio. So as you move away from pKa, the implications of pH matter more and more and more. And we're officially out of time for this chapter. The only thing I didn't get to was Lewis acids, which is a whole paragraph I think you guys got it handled. So we're going to pick up chapter three next week. I think it's set for Saturday. It's set for Saturday. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I set it for Saturday. Let me turn this off.